Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us here at Code Live. I'm your host for the day, Sam. And with me, I have my good friend, Rick. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you, Sam? I'm hanging in there. Um, actually, you are the... You are the good vibe that brought me back to my schedule because I have actually not been streaming uh, for you know several you know past weeks now. Something or the other comes up on Thursdays, so I have not been on schedule. So thanks for bringing me back back on track. Um, so happy uh, to. Yeah, this is the .NET Dev Show, folks. Uh, we are talking .NET uh, mostly uh, across web, desktop, mobile. But uh, Rick here uh, is an expert on reporting. So. Why don't you introduce yourself first, uh, Rick, and then we'll go. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Helwich. I'm a principal sales engineer here at Progress, um, this company. Uh, yeah, and I've been working with the, the reporting product for a little longer than I probably care to remember, <laughs> over a decade at this point. Um, it does lots of great things. Um, we talked about it a little bit during the R1 release webinar, and we had a new feature that came out. Uh, I was talking to Sam about called the shared data source, and we didn't have nearly enough time to dedicate to this feature <laughs> during during that presentation. So we decided to put some time aside to dedicate exclusively to the, the shared data source feature. All right. So um, maybe uh, Rick, you could take a small step back, you know, for folks who have never, you know, used uh, our reporting mm -hmm. solution, maybe just, you know, give us a high level before you dive in. And, and reporting is such a key part of, you know, many, many enterprise workflows. And so you want to make sure developers are productive and you're getting most of the things out of the box and you can, you know, ship reports that much faster. So back to your previous question, Sam. Okay. So high level telc reporting at the, uh, 10,000 foot level for everyone who, who didn't attend the, the webinar. Shame on you. Um, do, you so, do you mind pulling up the web page as well while you're sure. talking through this? I can do that. Uh, so, Telic Reporting is a framework um, for uh, adding reporting features to a new or existing application. Um, it is based in .NET, so we could say it's .NET centric. Uh, but it supports pretty much every UI that's out there. So we say it's .NET centric, but UI agnostic. So we have report viewers, that's the, the front end user interactive um, portal for everything from native Blazor down to um, cl classic wind forms, classic web forms, um, Ajax, w w WPF. WPF, MAUI, all the platform tools, um, all the web tools. I, I think we even still ship one for Silverlight, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, so we have the the back end, the .NET, the front end, the pretty much anything you want. And then there's the the user side, so three report designers. We'll be looking at two of them today. Um, and those are stand, a standalone utility and a web-based utility, the standalone web designer and the um, web-based report designer. And those are sort of the three pillars of reporting. You combine them uh, as needed to create reports, build reporting into your existing solutions, uh, and just basically enable your your users to both consume reports and make their own reports and really do whatever you want. It is you know out of the box immensely powerful, but when you really start scratching the uh, you know below the, the surface, uh, you open up a ton of uh, flexibility. And I hope to get into some of that today. So show some of the uh, customization, you know, when you when you scratch below what comes out of the box. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And is this um, Chrome th theme like how you roll, like all reddish? Ah, uh, yeah. In general, in general, right. it's one of one of the Chrome themes. Um, which I think this should be a uh, a blue one. I think I clicked the wrong um, wrong profile, but we'll be correcting that after. Um, yeah. No so worries. yeah. Our demos uh, on the website, if anyone wants to play with it without having to install anything, has all of our uh, sample reports. Um, this is a good one, the uh, invoice report to, to load up just because it has a little bit of everything in it. We'll see when that loads. You can explore around that we're looking at here is the, the report viewer, um, which is this portal that the report loads in. And, um, you know, simply because of the fact that we're live streaming, the server is being a little, little sluggish today. Um, here it goes. 
Uh, so here's the here's one of our, our sample reports. Um, this is an invoiced in invoice type report. It has some some you know, interesting features included, like uh, column sorting and headers. When you dig into the under the covers, it's a uh, multi-tiered report with a sub-report for order details um, and passing data back and forth. Uh, so that's always a good one to look at. And we also have a live running version of our web report designer. If you wanted to try out this utility, again, without having to install anything or run anything, not that those, those are hard steps, but you know, you can certainly just log in and start playing with things. So, and because none of this is actually saved, you know, you can break anything you want. You can move tables around and go, I don't like that pie charts, delete that and yeah, you know, do do anything you want. This is a, a live editor. But yeah. you can't break and, it. And Rick talks about this uh, every release and every you know webinar. But I'm just blown away by how much we can do on the web. It's you know feature parity and more compared to even like you know desktop based report designers that we have always had. And it has a few tricks that the desktop one doesn't have, uh, like this uh, yeah. global, uh, universal search bar. Um, it's a web. It's a web first feature. And actually, what we're talking about today, the um, shared data source is only fully empowered via the web portal. You can still use it with the standalone report designer, but you can't quite use it to its full capacity, at least yet. Interesting. Hmm. OK, so you think we're ready to jump into some code, Sam? Yeah, so and, and when you say data source, like it, you are you're instantiating an object that can connect to whatever be your you know data repository wherever it's coming from and you want that object to be shared you know across reports mm -hmm. right yeah we'll walk through um okay. uh, sort of the the whole point of the, of the shared data source is, is part, part of it but um yeah so the overall goal is to all, all reports have associated data this one you can see Oh, this one's actually even using a shared data source. Look at that. Um, they've updated the demos to use them. Uh, so the, this data source here is it available to be used across multiple reports without having to duplicate it, uh, know the selection criteria, know the, the queries that were used for it. And it can just be sort of brought into the report. Pri um, previous to this, you could share sort of the connections, the connection strings, but the actual criteria for the the data, the the query that pulls it from the data source, the parameters that it's going to be using um, was all unique. And every report had to have its own data source. So if you have five reports using the same data source, you have five copies. You know, you make a small change to a table, to change a table name because you realize a little too late that you spelled something wrong or you want to add some more data, you have five places to go and change it. Um, if you want to provide your um, end users the ability to uh, run that report, you have to give them that access to that full data source, including the selection criteria. And you know they may or may not use the columns you want them to use. So this is a great way of sort of abstracting that away. You can you know preserve it somewhere offsite. You can like we're going to do today, load it into a database, serialize it, uh, deserialize it when needed at runtime. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do there. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think we really need to see it. To, to yeah, get a yeah let's, on. let's see it. And uh, while you're doing that, Thindle. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thindle is our good friend over in Sweden. Ah, good afternoon. Okay. We are... So as you are pulling this up, like the like the data source, once you create a new one and you connect mm -hmm. up to your SQL, whatever be your data, you know, uh, repository are you saying like in visual studio or in the desktop report editors we could not share before so the the data source would have been embedded in the report explicitly um, okay as part of the report and it would have contained all of that criteria as properties in the report itself so it would have been in the report I see. Uh, okay. um, and if you like want within to the report you can share you could share the entire report and you can duplicate right. that report. But okay. the actual entity itself is duplicated. So okay. the idea is to do a many to one type of relationship. So I guess it would be one, one to many. So you want to have one data source that's in a repository somewhere, whether that be a folder on the file system, which you get out of the box, or somewhere on the cloud or in a database, and be able to use that in multiple reports. And again, there are lots of reasons why you'd want to do that. 
maintainability, reusability, obfuscation, uh, lots of good reasons. But let's start with a new um, ASP.NET Core solution because uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this all live, and we'll call it porting. Yes. So this is ASP.NET Core running .NET Core. on .NET 6. Okay. I'm going to do .NET 6 LTS and create. And we'll give that a second to, to spin itself up. Just updated uh, Visual Studio, and I'm enjoying the new build. How about you, Sam? Uh, are you running the one that's on .NET 8 or just uh, the regular 17.5? No, I believe this is the the official 17, uh, 17 five, yeah. 17 five, yeah. Yeah, I'm still on this. I actually have not um, gotten up to .NET 8 yet because there are a few things. I mean, the, the first preview uh, is out. Um, but, you know, I, I was talking to somebody else on stream, like uh, things move fast in the .NET and Visual Studio uh, world nowadays. And, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of stability uh, to, you know, get, through what you're doing. If you have like VMs lying around, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. For something like this, I would only, you know, roll out within a, an official build. Okay. Um, too, too many loose ends otherwise. Right. Okay. So we have just the basic core solution. And one thing I want to show is how easy it is to get set up with, with reporting. So I really haven't done anything here other than create the um, initial shell the application. And I have reporting installed already, which adds what we call the Visual Studio extensions, which lets me do a cool thing uh, by right-clicking here on the solution. And we can go to add new item. Um, this is the new the new, yeah, new item yeah. template. Yeah. New file uh, template. Yeah. Um, I actually really like it, but it does not work for, for this example. So we're going to go back to the old school one. Um, we want to find this the Telerik web report designer html5 page 1 r1 2023 template say that 10 times fast uh, and click add so this is going to spin up a wizard and it's going to ask me a bunch of questions do i want to create a new uh, rest service which i do do you want to use the sample report definition which i do click well i guess it'll ask me two questions <laughs> And now it's going to do all the hard work for me of creating those controllers, those services, setting up the uh, dependency injection, uh, building out my uh, program CS, um, adding all the appropriate references. So all the all the hard work that you would uh, you know normally do yourself is going to go ahead and do for you. And it gives us the web report designer page um, as an HTML yeah. file. Um, Rick, before you go on, um, what's your resolution? Is it 1080p? Uh, um, maybe you need to bump up the fonts a little bit. I, I can bump the fonts. It should be 1080p, but if it's not looking right, I can double check it for you. Yeah, there you go. That's better. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, no, this is fine. So the thing that you chose was the report designer template. Yes, I did. Okay. So there are multiple templates in there. You could just choose one of the viewer templates, which would it wouldn't create the designer. It would create the viewer the and the um, rendering engine which is really all you need to get started uh, along, along with the sample report. But because we're focusing on what we do design time, we want to use the shared data source, we really need the, the, web, des the web designer. Now, I don't actually have a front end portal here. I could add one separately just by you know, repeating that process, doing add and selecting a report viewer. But um, as we'll see in a second, the web report designer builds in a report viewer for the um, preview tab. So when you're building a report and you want to preview it, you know you have to see what it looks like. You click the preview; it has a built-in HTML5 report viewer. So we can we can use that. We don't need to you know build out a front-end you know UI for users because we're we're just working in uh, sort of admin mode. So you essentially started from a blank ASP.NET um, app, right? Yep. So yep. what well, did no. it add? Yeah, what did it add? It added a new controller. So it adds the controller, the report design controller. Um, this is actually a very minimalistic file because it's just really um, using dependency injection. Uh, it adds so it adds the um, HTML file, which is the entire embodiment of the web designer. So the entire web designer is 
this 51 lines of code or so. The real magic happens because it's using the built-in services uh, of the of the controller to sort of load all of the resources on demand. So these two lines here are sort of how we're able to only have this down to a few lines of code. Most of this is comments. Um, uh, it's, you know, point to the initial report you want to load um, and the endpoint for the designer controller and a few pieces of meta information around how you want the toolbox to be laid out and different things like that. Um, and really that's all there is. All the magic happens in two files, um, program.cs, which is uh, the, the new uh, main configuration file. Well, I don't know how new it is, but I think it was .NET five, Sam, when they started putting mm -hmm. everything into program yeah. CS. Um, mm -hmm. And the app settings JSON uh, file, which we'll be using later for some custom configuration. Um, those are already pre-existing, but it adds some uh, additional information. So we have the, the builder here for you know the uh, adding singleton for your dependency injection. Uh, this is where it creates the, um, where it injects the um, iReport service configuration. Uh, in here is where you have your setup uh, information for, for that. Um, so there's really, there's two of them here. You can see this one is what gets built for the report viewer uh, built into the report in the web designer. And then here is the information for the uh, designer itself and the properties that the user can set. We're going to be playing with... Um, Oh, we'll be overloading this one, the, the shared data source storage. So out of the box, it has uh, what we call the, the implementation of the file shared data source storage. And we're, we're uh, probably getting ahead of ourselves a bit um, here. But what this basically does is it basically means that your shared data source is a file. It's, it's going to be on the, um, your local file system. And this implementation knows where to get it from. Uh, we want to put it in a database. So we're going to do some tricks to load it into a database. The air, air quotes, proper way to do this actually is to implement a new version of the iShare data source storage interface and build out all of the interfaces that it needs to have a fully a new version of, of this. Um, but I think there's about uh, a dozen or so different methods I would have to build because everything you can do, um, uploading, downloading, creating new folders, deleting folders, all of this, you know, asynchronous, you have to handle all of those things because they're all things that are built into the front end UI. Um, mm -hmm. We wouldn't have time <laughs> to, to build out, you know, every one of those over, um, um, overloads and, and build out the uh, custom solution. So I'm going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to manually copy one of them into a database uh, and, we will um, just overload the um, the resolve uh, method, which lets you, was, what's, what's responsible for actually going and finding the shared data source and, and resolving it. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Your only before question you, was. <laughs> yeah, before you do like that, but I mean, at, at this point, like what did it bring in? It brought in a default report definition, but you don't actually have a database, nothing to no. pull from, right? So By what default, would happen if, if you run it, if you run the app now? Oh, we're going to, we're going to find out in a second when, okay. when I run it. Um, yeah. And that's pretty much everything is there's one, you know, helper, helper uh, method that we have here and that's just getting a local um, directory. So yeah, by default, everything runs as file based. Um, uh, on the server. And that's where all the files and folders live. And let's see, somewhere a window is loading. There it is. So this is the, so just the blank portal that we get um, with uh, .NET Core. And I believe it was web designer, maybe. Mm. So, so first time you load, you, it's going to ask you if you want the tour. We don't need that. And here's the sample report that it that it created. We can preview this, and we're seeing the um, report design report viewer that I talked about in the preview tab. And uh, fully functional report. We can go back to design. We have the um, here. That's a TRDP file, basically a compressed XML file. And 
we have our menu with where you can save everything. But if we go back to Visual Studio. And, and, and the data for all of this is just wired up in the, in the file itself. It's not pulling from anything anywhere else. Yeah, exactly. So if I open, let's see, explore. You can see that it creates a bunch of folders for me. We have the reports folder, which has that report in it. Um, resources folder. Um, this is used for a lot of interesting things, the asset store and um, uh, other files that are you know, used in a report can be stored in resources. We'll talk about that later at some point. Um, and we have the shared data source folder, which is where all of our shared data sources will go. We don't actually have any yet in the solution. So this is an empty folder. So my goal is to try and get the shared data source uh, into a database and resolve it from there. But let's, uh, yeah, let's jump in and try creating uh, and working with the shared data source. So I know I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. We still have a lot to do and <laughs> we're running a little short on time. So let's load back I won't interrupt in. you as much. Say again? I won't interrupt you as much, but I, <laughs> I'm, I'm very good with dumb questions. No, no. There's no such thing as a dumb question, Sam. Okay, so we should probably just create a, a brand new report with a brand new data source so we can sort of walk through walk through that process. So, oh, this is interesting because you're not actually doing this through Visual Studio. You're doing it while the app is running. For yeah, the most of this I'm going to be doing while the app is running, just so to create those initial resources. Then I'll I'll close down the front end portal, jump back into Visual Studio. See. And we'll use you know the resources that we create and uh, try and see if we can make them work in a different way. So um, I want to create a report and it's going to be a well, I'll do it as a TRDP file so I can show you a little secret later. Um, and we'll just use all the default locations and click save. Okay. So first thing you need to do is we need an initial um, data source. So let's go to components. SQL data source. I'm going to plug into my VentureWorks database. And actually, oh, how does me... it know the connection? Uh, it's being preserved in one of the um, in one of the uh, configuration files that it pulls from oh. uh, my my user profile, um, and that's how it knows that, that that's already there. Actually, this one, I think this one comes with reporting. That's how it makes that connection. Um, Magic. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, sure where that gets populated from sometimes. Let's just build a new one though. Um, can I, oh, I need to know the connection string offhand. Eh, I changed my mind. <laughs> Let's use the built-in one. It'll go next. And we're gonna embed this directly in the report definition. Um, the, and hit next. And let's see, we need a select statement. So let's see. I remember my adventure works. Oh boy. Old school SQL example table. Let's see if that works. Yeah, not bad. Okay, so we have a data source which brings some data back from one of the tables and we'll hit finish. And right now we haven't done anything with the shared data source. Um, this is just sort of uh, old school um, reporting. So we're gonna go to our report, expand the data tab, associate the data source um, for the report with the new one we just created. That makes those logical connections. We go into the Explorer tab. We have our, what's called an inline data source. Um, now that the single explicit data source that only belongs to this report and this report only and we can start adding some information. So let's say product ID and we'll grab the uh, name. And maybe the color and list price is always a good one. So list price. Name is likely to be the longest of these fields. So let's give a little more real estate to the name pro property. 
I was going to point the the snapping lines in so nice now. This is all in the web. All in the web. I mean, mm -hmm. I used to avoid using uh, the web designer a little bit just because of some of these niceties weren't available yet. But now it has you know everything that I that I use for you know report creation. So some of the tooling is still you know uh, TBD, but it's really like not that um, not that more much more challenging at all to do any of this stuff. You know, for example, I had to type the SQL expression explicitly. I couldn't go into a builder and click on, you know, a hierarchical table of, of fields. Um, but the good news is that our our designers are completely cross compatible too. So I could have always opened this report and the, the other designer done some of the heavy lifting and then gone back into this one for the the fine tuning. But I think we have a report at this point. So let's hit preview. Okay, mm -hmm. not the most exciting report I've ever created, but. Uh, I think it gets the job done. Okay, so now we have a report. This is just a basic, um, like I said, basic everyday report that you know we've been creating, you know, more or less for ten years. Let's show the the new the new coolness. So this is what we get with the the web report designer. You can go to the shared data source and you can click on the um, uh, three ellipse. And oh, go save to as. Okay. save as shared data source. That's going to pop this up, and it's going to say, "Well, you want to save it as a shared data source. What do you want to call it? Um, we'll leave it the same name as you know default SQL data source one. Um, actually, let's call it two. Now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and then this is an important checkbox: uh, replace data source in report. So what this is going to do is it's going to delete. After we hit save, it's going to delete the inline data source. It's going to create a shared data source, and then it's going to associate that shared shared data source back with this report. So it saves us that manual step. So we'll do uh, we'll do save and open, just so you can see what it looks like. So this is the shared data source in its file format: SDSX shared data source XML. Um, and this is the visualization of that object. And basically, it's it's three properties. Um, it's you have the location, which you can't change, you have a description, which is blank, uh, type, and really the only thing you can really populate in, in this um, portal right now is the description if you wanted to. Um, if you wanted to configure, you could rebuild any of the information in the data source, but we're keeping it you know, exactly as it is. This would be the maintenance portal. So down the line, my connection string changes, um, you know, I migrate to a different server, I need to change the data that's being brought in, you can make maintenance um, updates here. We're going to cancel that. And so at this point, like if you run it, it's going to look the same, but the, you know, the entity of the shared data source is just not with the report itself. Correct. So let's go back to report one. So now we're going to see, let me collapse. Um, we're going to see that inline data source is empty, but shared data sources is, is populated. So this is the SQL one data source. And um, that's what it's using in the, um, in the drop down here. So this is the shared data sources is a collection that is external to this report. In fact, let me just make sure I save this uh, and we'll do a quick preview, sanity check. Okay, it still works. Um, we can go back to design. Now, if I were to do file new report, report two. Oh, so the report two will also get to see the existing shared resource and see. I have my shared data sources here. So now that whole process we went through, having to create a data source, type in the selection criteria. All I, all I have to do now is come in here, click this, hit that save. Can all stay together. Yeah. And, and you can have like different stored procs within that shared source that serve up different different reports. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's always going to use the same selection criteria, same query, whether that be a stored procedure or a explicit query like I'm using. But because we had all of these records and what would I, I use name and, and color and everything, let's, let's, we can do, in this one, let's do product ID and weight. This is a different report. I care, I care about different things, right? Yeah. Um, same data source, uh, completely different report, but same connection string, same selection criteria. Um, and it should, if I remember to actually use the data source, um, uh, load some information, I guess. I guess weight isn't a highly, <laughs> highly populated property. I, I, I picked pretty well. Uh, oh, wait, there we go. <laughs> we got some data. But 
moral of the story um yeah. two reports one data source it's being shared it's it's namesake is safe um so at, at this point like you've done all of this on localhost while your app is running so um now if you go back to your file system you're going to see this stsx file yes let me let me kill the front end and we're going to go back to back to the page where did yeah. and uh, while you're doing the chat room let us know if you have any questions anything you want you know rick to dive into more yeah yeah by all means Here's that folder we looked at before. Uh, it was empty. Now it has the, uh, the SQL shared um, data source in it. Uh, this is the same name I gave it. Now let's take a peek at this in uh, Notepad. And you can see that what's under the covers here. It's just an XML file. It has the selection criteria in it. It okay. has the connection string, everything that you need to, to, to get data. And sort of maintain in in this file. So, I think yeah, I think we have time to to play with some custom configuration. So, my goal is to try and load this file from a database instead of from the local file system. Um, there's a lot of a lot of reasons why you want to do that. In fact, what you would really want to do is have everything stored in a database. The reports the uh, SQL data sources, um, the resource files. You can even load the, um, uh, the storage or caching information to and from a database, which is you know, much faster than doing it um, on a file system. And it supports um, uh, web farms. So if you wanted to roll this into a web farm solution, you would have to uh, have that configuration um, in a database to really be optimized and to share sessions across multiple instances, instances of the, the farm. Um, so this is a bit more of a, you know, sort of enterprise solution at that, at that point. Um, yeah. Actually, before you switch, can I ask you a uh, kind of a not so nice question here, maybe, but <laughs> okay. can, let's say you build this out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a designer that can work with, uh, you know, shared data source, uh, you know, a couple mm -hmm. of reports. And <clears throat> excuse me, you give me access to uh, this app, right? Okay. What is stopping me from messing up the, you know, the shared data source? Like, can you stop me from editing the SQL itself? Uh, if I give you this file, no. Um, you, if you can access the file, you can go in, you can change the SQL. Uh, so the intent isn't really to to lock out users from from changing things. The in intent is to make the report creation process easier. Um, yeah. uh, although with what we're going to do, putting the report in a database, you do actually enable some of that feature at that point, because now you as a report writer may not have access to that database to change it. You could, mm -hmm. um, you know, have read access, which would allow you to utilize those resources, but not change them. So that actually is something that you can do with a bit more uh, of an advanced setup. Right, right. So every report that is using a shared data source, um, I mean, I can essentially uh, edit that data source itself. I mean, uh, I'm just trying to see like if there is a way for me to just not mess up all of the other reports that you know depend on that shared data source. Sure. So the shared data source uh, ideally should not need to be changed very much. The the intent is sort of provide a universal data source from someone who has the authority um, to right. you know design such things, and then have the users be able to utilize them and not have to worry about the data configuration at all. That whole part should be abstracted away from the majority of of, um, of report designers in order to you know create the reports. So as we saw, I created a second report. I didn't do anything with selection criteria. I just saw the fields that I had and I grabbed a few and I created a report with them. Um, that's really the workflow, you know, that, that you can right. focus on when you're using a shared data source. Uh, if you give them more meaningful names than uh, data source one, data source two, uh, it can actually, you know, be easy for a user to look at the data sources that are available to them from the drop down, pick the one that's most appropriate, and sort of just sort of go from there. Um, they don't have to worry about where they're saved. They don't have to worry about um, making changes to them. Um, whether or not, you know, you need to lock information down, that's a bit of a different um, 
yeah, different story. Um, but certainly something that can be achievable. OK, so what are we doing? So first thing is we need to get that data source into a um, database, I guess. So let's see. I, I've only done, um, so <laughs> uh, fair warning, I've only done this once before, and it wasn't as nearly complex a scenario as we're doing now. So we'll see how this all goes. Um, yeah. What I what ha did. What happens live is the only thing that could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're having fun. We're 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 just we're gonna play. Um, I created a sample reporting database, uh, a couple meaningful folders, um, some test data which we're not using, uh, a reports folder, and a shared data sources um, uh, table. And then these four tables here um, are used for the caching. Um, at some point in the future, maybe we'll do another live stream where I'll show how to set up caching, you know, in the uh, in the database. But um, that's what these four do. But I have a shared data sources folder here that I created, and I'm just going to, like I said, these are not good practices, Sam. But <laughs> we have limited time, so we're going to make it work. Um, so this so. was literally just a table, and you're pointing it to a file. Um, this is just a table, and it doesn't even point to a file. The, oh, you the, actually have the definition right there. Yeah, I, I have the full definition XML in the table, and um, the file name is just the, the resource identifier. So oh. we're going to create a new, um, new column. And again, had I fully overloaded that um, uh, shared data source storage interface and implemented all... I, it's like 12, 14, you know, different methods. I could use a different resource identifier, but because we're basically hijacking the file, um, the file configuration, and we're just uh, overloading one specific method that is responsible for loading the, um, the actual XML, uh, it still is using a file-based resource identifier, but um, it works, it works well enough for, you know, uh, for this demo. need the I need to keep I need to remember to not close this folder <laughs> okay let's grab the full file name and this could really be anything but my report is already set up to look for this file name this is what in the in the report itself this is the resource identifier that our report one was configured to use so I could change it if I wanted to but there's no need to okay so that is going to be that and here. Let's open this. Say control C. Okay. There we go. It's the, the world's best database insertion. I, I have questions about this, but go on. <laughs> ask your questions, Sam. Ask your questions. So what you're essentially doing, like, would you still have the ability to change the selection criteria if you just pull the file from a database as compared to just on the file system? Uh, change the selection criteria. You like, mean in the in the report? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you, you could so uh, still know how to write to the definition column. Um, that is would all be handled in a full implementation of this thing here, the shared data source storage. So let me just peek the definition here. Um, so you can see in here, um, everything is uh, all, all of the handlers. So um, save async. Um, the over uh, overwrite and um, you know get model uh, all of these methods are defined in that interface. So I would have to come in and I would have to uh, basically write a um, uh, write a new method for each of these. So create so even built into the UI, there's the ability to create a separate subfolder and organize your shared data sources into subfolders. I would have to you know write the 
um, method that creates a subfolder in a separate table of um, of the database, you know, to maintain a list of folders. And then I have to have a third table that associates um, uh, sort of a, a one-to-many relationship of folders to um, share data source files. And there's a sort of a lot of meta information to sort of implement in order to sort of have that full life cycle. That's why we, we provide one out of the box now as part of the file system. Um, I think we'll be probably building additional uh, data source storage um, uh, models in the future that we can provide that you can simply new up from the from the package. Um, but that's a, you know, that's a, it's not unachievable. It's just, it's a bit much to do in an hour webinar. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, right now we're, we're just, um, we are breaking the model a little bit, um, because we're, we're hijacking sort of one event. Uh, but you can assume that all your data sources are already in the database and that you never need a user to make any changes to them. So the only thing um, a user is going to be doing is, uh, reusing the data sources that are available. So in that case, you would need, I think, three methods, one to find and enumerate, one to select, and one to actually resolve the, the data sources. But in, in this case, like I said, we're, we're going we're gonna to cheat a little bit. We're going to try and just resolve the data source um, from the database. And, and see. we'll see how it goes uh, if, <laughs> if we get it done in the next 15 minutes or so. I don't know. Are we able to go a little long, Sam, or are we yeah, locked yeah, into we, the? We, no, we're good. Okay. Uh, so let's create a new project. So new item. And try the new compact view, and we need a. Let's see. Shared. Um, Data. Yes. Um, shared data source, database resolver. Okay. And let's see. And let me check. This needs to implement. So essentially, at uh, runtime, you're trying to switch up which which one it results to, which one it uses. Yes. So this is going to be um, uh, loaded into the proce uh, report processor. Uh, at runtime, and it should uh, be able to then load this overload method and find um, uh, find the the data source that we put into the database. Okay, so I think it's just now complaining that I'm not uh, loading the resolver. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to use my my favorite trick. Um, um, from the old days of uh, serialized TV cooking shows and pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, there's a fully baked lasagna in the oven. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Because no one wants to watch me type. Um, and maybe, maybe bump up your fonts. I'm just sure. Is that okay, Sam? Yep. Okay. It's a little, it can be a little more uh, vertical scrolling, but I think we'll be okay. Um, okay. So I wrote this for different solutions. So I need to read through this code um, with you and we'll see uh, if it still makes sense. Okay. So, it is, so this is returning a, this is the resolve method, um, which is what we care about. And it's getting a data source ID. The ID is the is the file name still because, like I said, we're hijacking the the file um, uh, the file uh, storage. Um, and let's see. So you're literally screen. reading up the definition from that um, given row, given the shared data source ID, and then you essentially parse through that definition to get all the things out. Yeah. 
So what we're going to do is we can get the ID, the report. Um, report one is going to say, I have a shared data source that I'm using. Its name is shared data source two dot SX, S D S X shared data source XML. Yeah. Um, and it's going to give that name. Now this command should uh, go find that record. And we're only selecting um, the definition here. Uh, here. So we're selecting the definition. So we get to use um, execute scaler uh, instead of, uh, you know, we're only bringing back one column. And let's see, this all looks right. And then have a little sanity programming. So then what happens is we have that, um, we have that uh, XML that comes back and we load that into a memory stream. And then we have, um, we have this sort of magic function here. The uh, report XML serializer and deserialize. So we point that to the memory stream, and this is this is uh, a function of ours, uh, which will take that XML, it'll de deserialize it, and it returns a instantiated um, Telric reporting data source. So it's actually building a full data source in memory from that XML and returning that. So. This should um, work for for that. Let me put a let me put a breakpoint in here again. So, are are you going to now take away the two files that are in the local file system, so you can now point to the database and get that instead? I will. Um, I, I will take those away, but I I think they're still going to be used because we're not loading overloading everything. Um, oh, right. The file is still going to be used at a couple of different steps. Um, so I think if I if I were to fully delete it, we would get a few errors um, when I initially load. I, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, and I think maybe we'll do um, we'll do some trickery later just to, to prove that it was actually loading from the database. But we have a breakpoint to, sh to you know, show that this method was loading. Um, now there's... Uh, one more thing we have to do because all we actually did was we created a class doesn't actually do anything. Um, we're going to go into the app settings. Um, and let me grab the settings from a, another file here. because I absolutely promise if I try and type these, I will get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're literally pointing to you know, a thing in the database and then how to resolve it and the connection strings that go with it. And these these um, app settings files are notorious for um, having a small mistake and being kind of difficult to difficult to, de to debug. So what we're doing now is we are using the Telerik processing uh, settings. And we're saying that um, at runtime, um, when you're loading the processor, there's going to be a custom resolver that I want you to use. So that's the shared data source resolver and provider is custom. Um, and then we're saying that that custom resolver is going to be a type in this solution. And the type is going to be this, you know, that's wrong because our namespace is this now. And calling it this around. Okay. I think that should be everything I need to do. Um, because we're still you, we're still leveraging um, the majority of what's provided here, and we're just overloading the resolver step. Um, Again, I, I should build a fully, <laughs> a, a fully yeah, custom yeah. shared data source storage, but um, uh, we just don't have the uh, the time. Um, so let's try let's try running it. Be a small miracle if this works oh. the first time. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> where did I break? Oh, did I one, one too many? One too few? Look at that. Yeah. Drum rolls. 
<laughs> or maybe just fingers and everything crossed. Okay. So let's come back here. We're going to go to Did it, ah, it's still doing that weird thing. I thought this was fixed in the new version. Um, I don't know if you, have you seen this before, Sam, when you have a, a solution running on one monitor and you drag the um, browser to a different monitor, for some reason it stops the, the, the um, Visual Studio. Okay. So. Oh, there's a two one now. Uh, that was just me. Um, oh. I think uh, that figuring something. Um, so we can let's see. I hit preview and it should. Yep. Okay. So there you go. Mm -hmm. hit, hit our breakpoint so we can walk through this and show what it would do. We'll skip all this boring stuff. But wait, wait, hold on. Where, where did you get the resolver? The ID? Who passed that in? So the it got the resolver from the. Um, App settings. Now this is baked into the run the tug reporting uh, runtime. It's looking to the app settings JSON file for any additional configuration information that it might need, and it knows that I'm using a custom shared data source resolver because of this um, because of these settings. So at runtime, it's creating an instance of that, and it's going to find this one instead of this instead of the one that's built into the um, built into the. Uh, right, file right. share data source storage. This has its own built-in version of Resolve. It's using my my custom version instead. So could you go back to that new class and mm -hmm. and just hover over the shared data source ID? What is it that you're coming in with? Sure. So the shared data source ID is the actual what would have uh, been the, the file name. Because I again, see. the resolver, as it's written, would go and find that file name in the path. Um, path information is is already is set up um, in a different location, but it goes and it finds that that file in that folder path, and then it uh, loads it from there. So all I'm doing now is I'm saying you're not gonna, I don't want you to load that from the file path. I want you to go load that from the database instead. Right, right. Yep. Load up the definition from the database. Makes sense. Yep. So we have actually if we can do that sandy check. Yeah, we have the right file name, and that comes down to here. And let's see, what are we on? We're up the to connection, the, the try catch. Right. And if we hover yeah, this, we can see that we got our XML yeah. from the database. So we're going to skip that catch. We're going to come down. We're going to skip our sanity test. And now it's actually going to deserialize um, the XML and it's going to return this data source object. And that should be the end of the method. So I'm going to continue. And we end up back here. Yeah. With, uh, with that. Yeah, the product ID and the weights, yeah. Yeah, product ID and uh, it's a good point, Sam. Yeah, this is um, this is the report two. Yeah, so we have just the product ID and the weights. That's boring. Um, let's go to report one. So this is interesting because this is a different report, same shared data source. So does it uh, get that one from the application two? And it does. There you go. Mm. So it's pulling this out of uh, yeah, out of what we have in the web. So what we can do now is we have we have a few minutes left. Let's um, let's see. How can I prove that it's uh, pulling? It? I guess there's really no easy way to do that. <laughs> I get no, going, I mean, I get... <laughs> you, you, you can see that it's pulling it out yeah. of the database because like it's reading through that uh, resolver. Yeah, I thought I could, I could you know sneakily change something in the database file to show that, but that would break the report in the process. <laughs> yeah, I mean you could you could change the SQL inside the definitional, but that's going to mess up if, if you're looking for any rows in particular, or yeah. maybe you could change up the table name. Yeah, same I, I, same I, result though the report wouldn't render, but right, I mean, yeah. we can do that though. So with you know, let's let's um, if you know another table that has the same columns, yeah, <laughs> the same call, same same, <laughs> just different data. No, but you know, sometimes breaking something is is a test. So let me see if I can 
be when you're editing. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, okay, edit top 200 rows. So let me just find. Okay. So or maybe find... in maybe if you change the report too to have a different. Uh, if you take out the weights, so just have like a product ID, and maybe the product ID is there in a different table. Well, what I can do is. Um. Actually, break it. I mean, that's not valid anymore, right? So, yeah. when I try and preview this and hit continue, yeah. I'm going to get an error because it's pulling it from the database and not from the file. Yeah. If it was pulling it from the file, which I haven't changed at all, it would still work. So and actually, yeah. let's um, go back to design. Visual Studio. And I'm going to stop it real quick. Go to my app settings here, and we will get rid of. Let's see. Here to here. Yeah, because now it's going to go back to reading the file, and it'll still work, even though what you have in the database is wrong. This is just an example of the configurability and the redundancy um, of, of reporting. There's so much, yep, now, now it's yep, working again, because now it's pulling that from the file instead of from the database. There's so much that goes into designing um, and architecting these, um, uh, these classes yeah. that you can do. I, we, we barely scratch the surface. I mean, there are uh, there are resolvers. There are fallback resolvers. I could actually set this up in a way that if there's an error finding the um, finding the XML in the database, it can revert to a secondary processing methodology um, and now yeah. look for the file system. Um, that's something we've been doing for a very long time with the um, with the report resolver, which I, I think we did a stream of that at some point. If not, we're, we're definitely due to do one. Um, uh, you can put the entire report definition itself in the database, which is, um, yeah, let me, let me show you something real quick. So we have the uh, shared data sources, right? It's a upper level to our reports. And we have report one, report two, right? So now these are TR TRDP files. Um, but what I want to do is I want to create a copy, right? And let's rename that to... Super secret information. We're going to do is extract all. So our TRDB files are basically just compressed uh, information. So when you open up that file, you have two XML files. Um, and if you open up this definition to XML into Notepad, this itself is just an XML file. So we can mm -hmm. use the exact same process to um, put this into a database and right. then load it from there. Change up the definition on the on the fly. Yep. And this is exactly what we do in Telerik Report Server, which we haven't talked about at all, but um, is basically when we take our we take our entire reporting um, SDK and we build a full application around it and just sort of provide it to you as a turnkey solution. Um, this is all what, what we're doing behind the scenes is we take this XML and we load it into the database. Um, into a um, proprietary database that we set up and it manages it, it all for you. Um, if you didn't want to have to, you know, sort of build your own. Yeah. Sweet. No, this is this is a lot, a lot of configurability. Yeah, a lot of tweaking uh, if you needed yep. to. Yeah, I wanted to scratch the surface a little bit on, you know, on some of these things because there really is like so much you can do with them when you when you really want to, you know, design something that is custom and meets your need there's there's no end to how you can configure these things because everything can be overloaded everything can be redesigned reconfigured um if i have you know read only access to this table you know maybe i can look at this information and i can see um you know i, I can i can see it but i can't make any changes to it i can't break anything so yeah i can go into my 
my um, report and I can see that it's using SQL data source too, but maybe I can point it to a different data source if I want. I, I can point it to SQL data source one or you know anything else that's available in that table. Um, but I couldn't, you know, if it's hard coded to find its data sources from this table, I can't pull one in from somewhere else. Um, I can only use what's available to me. If I don't have right access to this table, I can't change it, you know? So I can, you know, it, break the report by pointing it to an invalid data source, but I can't, you know, uh, scope creep on what I can and can't see. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, really good stuff, hardcore, because like in just about an hour, you started from absolutely nothing, created shared, you know, uh, data sources, uh, used them from a file, then put them in the database. So very flexible. Let's see. I think, um, yeah. I mean, that's we're we're already a little over time. There's uh, if I I can show you anything else that you want to see. Anything? Any questions anyone has? You know, happy to answer. No, I think anything more is gonna melt my brain. <laughs> I, I I keep going back to like some of the authorization and authentication things like that you talked about. Like like you were saying, like the shared data source is something that an admin should do and just not have anybody mess with it. And then, you know, spew off any number of reports from there. Um, yeah, oh, uh, our good friend uh, Aztec is here. Hey, looking forward to catching this video on demand. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I think Aztec might be using reporting if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, Aztec, what Rick was trying to show is the new feature of shared data sources. So you can have that entity not be embedded in the report itself. And then multiple reports can use that shared data source. And it's very configurable how you use it. Absolutely. But I mean, again, the hero of the story is um, I still have my customizations disabled. So we can just go back in. Report designer. The hero of the story is still the you know, the built-in shared data source configuration, which even if you want to roll completely out of the box, you know, you know, not make any customizations. I mean, open Visual Studio, you know, other than you know maybe creating the initial application. Um, it still has you know uh, an immense amount of um, power behind it. And and right in here, like once you see that shared uh, data source, like what can you edit actually if you go into that? What's the what's the ellipsis? As it's built in, so once I see that, um, I can open for editing. It will open the the meta information, um, which is just the description. But if I go to configure uh, from here, oh, I, I can there change anything, anything, anything I want, you know, in, in the yeah. shared data source. Yeah. So this is um, you know how it's provided out of the box with that that single um, implementation of the the shared data source storage. Um, if you wanted to do something different, you could you know implement that interface and really build anything you want. You just have to handle all the scenarios. So for, so for shared data source, if I were saving it, let's see. Yeah, may, maybe, uh, and and I'm sure that like, there are ways in which we can lock this down. But maybe um, as like a product feature, we could enable that if you are giving me access to this report designing app. Uh, it's fine that I can see the shared data source, but don't let me edit that at all. Like, it's just like, I'm, I'm dumb. Don't let me touch it. That's, that's you setting it up. Um, I can still use it, but I cannot change any of it. Yeah. I mean, that's something that we could definitely consider, um, whether or not that's, you know, better for the, um, report server, um, product, uh, or, you know, better in, in reporting SDK. So sort of philosophically, the way we've handled things in the SDK is we've given you the the API advantage to do whatever right, you want. Right. No, you're right, you're right. And, yeah. and in and in report server, we've, you know, made some hard choices for you. <laughs> we, right, we, all, right. we also do all the work um, and give you yeah. something that's just turnkey. Um, yeah, you're right. Because like the report server has those roles and authorizations much more, you know, granular and you can, you know, like, like you're saying, like the work is done for you. So this is kind of raw bits. This is all the power you need from an API level. And then, you know, if you want the report server, that gets to your, you know, fine-tuned tweaking. And the another point in consideration is the the paint on this feature is, you know, is still wet. I mean, it just came out in the last release. We provide just this one, um, you know, just this one build of the of uh, data source storage. 
if you look at a more mature feature like the um, the report resolver, we provide you know, six different versions of this. <laughs> you can get them from URIs, you can get them from um, from types, you can load them from XML. And actually, in another solution I was playing with last night, I think I still have that open. Yeah, here it is. I'll bring that over. This is um, I was experimenting last night with a couple of different scenarios to see what I wanted to show today. Um, in this one, I went, implemented a totally custom um, report resolver. Um, this is a more mature feature, and I was able to, to do this a, a little, you know, little differently than the the shared data source resolver. Um, so this loads reports from the you know from the database um, uh, in addition to the the um, shared data source. And it's because it's you know made more easily because it has features like the the fallback resolver you know handling that's built in, and you can um, implement it you know uh, as a as a separate resource that's you know pulled into the um, uh, dependency injection. So here I see it's the same same I report service configuration, um, and I just load the resolver here, whereas like we saw with the the shared data source um, resolver, is you have to use the app setting sort of app runtime replace um, replace the the resolver as part of the um, uh, as part of the storage container. So yeah, I probably just confused the heck out of everybody right there. Um, but the moral of the story is that um, there are more there's more tooling that we can build to make a lot of these scenarios you know a little more easier to build out. Yep, yep, makes sense, makes sense. But uh, you know, bravo on getting uh, this amount of customization done in an hour. It's, it's uh, <laughs> impressive. Uh, All I right. stand on the shoulder of giants, the, yeah, you know, the brilliant engineers that designed, you know, the, the, these APIs. They're the ones who made it possible. Indeed, indeed. All right, Rick. Uh, and if, if there's anything else to you want to show while you have your desktop shared, um. Yeah, unless there are questions, no. I mean, I could spend the rest of the day, you know, going through all the features. You know, how much time do you have, Sam? <laughs> uh, well, well, why don't you bring up the browser one last time? Like, if folks want to dive into this, this is, you know, new as of uh, R1 release for us, which was, you know, early January. So go get the hot bits and try this out. And you're going to see all of this, uh, you know, light up uh, for your apps. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just go to telework.com. On telework reporting and the uh, yeah the big the big pink button here. I'll give you a thirty day trial to play with all these toolings. Yep, absolutely. And if you you know get get the you know bits for some other way, NuGet or you know through the installers, you're going to see the updates uh, show up or the control panel if you're still using that. So however you get your bits, uh, that's how to see the newest functionality. All right, cool, very very cool. Uh, Rick, uh, if you're good, uh, I will bring down your desktop. Yep, absolutely. All right. All right, people. Uh, yeah, Aztec, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, and yes, this will be you know up on the YouTubes uh, pretty quickly. And uh, Rick, taking, uh, thanks for taking the time to show me this thing for you know building something custom in an hour. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this feature, you know, was something that deserved you know more time than I was able to allocate in the, the big webinar release. So, I mean, there are a lot of other things too that deserve a full hour. So, I mean, you know, we should uh, we should get a few more of these on the schedule, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, Thindle, Aztec, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this was uh, a fun hour of reporting. Uh, not something we do, uh, like you said, Rick, uh, often enough. So we should do more. Uh, you, you, we, we're always, you know, talking about, you know, building the apps, like functionality itself. We don't talk enough about testing and, and reporting and Fiddler and then those other productivity things that we always, you know, uh, that go with the apps. So we'll do more of that. Have a good rest of your day. Be well, be productive, and we'll see you on the next stream. Thanks, Sam. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.